And throughout all these, we've used a number of machine learning techniques. But since this is the neural network uh, aficionados, I thought I'd sort of give you sort of what I've seen. And right now, we're in a sort of hype phase. But I'll try to give you some in indications of, of the ups and downs of the history of, of, of neural networks, where it's been popular, then not popular, then popular again, and not popular. And the origins of the world, we're actually like, we're actually like into 60 years <laughs> of, the, of, the, of the topic. The real origins uh, come from in the 1940s with, with, with really uh, simple uh, ideas of learning rules. And if you actually look at some of the papers uh, in the 1940s and 50s, I think people were quite ambitious. People really thought that, well, actually, maybe we can create a brain, right? And we're actually probably closer to that now, but we're still a long way from it now. But in those days, people were quite optimistic. And in the 1950s, the first elements of the simplest neural network, we call a perceptron, where you have um, a single computational unit with a number of inputs going in, came along. And then uh, Bernard Woodrow at Stanford, and uh, Morris Hoppert, uh, his student, came up with a little simple speech recognition system to recognize digits. And interestingly, Hoff became quite famous. Hoff ended up founding Intel and uh, uh, became quite rich, actually. And um, uh, people were quite, quite, uh, um, I wasn't born at this point, so, uh, but this is what the, the history books say. People were quite keen on the topic until uh, in the 1960s, Minsky, Marvin Minsky at MIT, uh, came up with a paper that said, well, actually, these simple networks are just like one unit, uh, can't solve nonlinear problems. And so that put a damper on the whole field, and people went home, and uh, funding got cut, and there was a lot of um, uh, investment in what I call expert system methods of artificial intelligence. So in the sort of 60s, 70s, uh, what people called artificial intelligence were generally rule-based systems, knowledge-based systems. Uh, LISP uh, came out of that that, that era uh, to to, to um, solve problems with, uh, with rules. Uh, there are still people working on it, you know, Cajonan in, in, uh, in, in Finland, in the Institute of Helsinki, uh, was coming up with sort of different clustering methods to have data organize themselves. But really the, the, the next big, you know, the nuclear winter you can think of is really 60s and 70s. In the 1980s it came back up with, 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 a, with a big bang. And the main, um, uh, uh, technique that, that sort of made people interested was a seminal book, really, it's a pair of books, and some, some of you may have seen them by uh, um, uh, Rubble Art McClelland. Uh, McClelland's at Stanford, uh, uh, in the psychology department right now, he's the chair of the department, uh, which actually explained the back propagation algorithm and how to train weights across multiple different layers. Um, the technique had been out there in other contexts and economics you know, a few years before, but it was really and not until this, these books came out that it was explained in relatively simple language that all of a sudden a lot of people became really interested in the topic and started to, you know, a little bit of software models came out and people started applying it to all sorts of uh, uh, problems uh, that had been uh, uh, traditionally used, been used uh, had been solved by expert system approaches. So speech recognition, handwriting recognition, credit scoring, uh, all of a sudden, all of these topics uh, came up. But typically, and I would say this is the same today, um, the neural network component is often used with other techniques. So other popular techniques, still popular today, hidden markup models, dynamic programming, various clustering methods. Hidden markup models are a technique this is not a whole lecture, I mean, I've only got 10 minutes, but it's, uh, it's a um, uh, more of a time domain, finite, uh, more probabilistic state machine where, for example, you uh, dissect a spoken word into phonemes and you're trying to say, well, when does a word move from one phoneme to another phoneme, like uh, pleasant, when does it go pluh, 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 eh, zuh, and the probabilities are uh, represent the time spent in each, uh, in each phoneme. Those probabilities are trained um, uh, 
using uh, something called the bone well shower algorithm. Um, and then one of the things uh, I'm trying to think through versus then versus now, quite a few companies came out which were generic neural network software companies. Though most of the companies that succeeded were companies that actually specialized in a topic. You know, they weren't really neural network companies, they were speech companies, they were OCR companies, uh, they were financial credit scoring companies. Um, and um, people would use any techniques that worked, right? And the uh, hidden markup models was the big technique that <coughs> most speech recognition uh, companies used. And um, you're finding that uh, companies just started working on their own systems. As we're hitting the sort of this era, we're finding that companies, we look at the IBM uh, Watson, we've just released an API, um, look at the stuff that Dave's doing with Ursats, uh, look at some of the other companies. We're seeing like tools that other people can use as well. So just in the example of um, no one really builds their own database anymore. Um, they just buy it from Oracle, or they use uh, uh, MySQL. Um, they just use it. No one actually writes the square root function anymore. At high school, you learn how to write the square root function as a Taylor series. No one actually does that. They just push a button on the calculator. They use the function in their program. And the, the, uh, we're just seeing now companies coming up with tools so you don't actually have to know everything about neural networks. You can just know what you have to do. And so why has there been more interest in the field? Um, there's certainly been algorithmic improvements. So in the old days, we were just using one layer of neural networks, um, uh, uh, maybe a couple of layers. Now we're using what's called deep learning, which is multiple layers. Uh, we're using current uh, nets. Those were, those, that, those were around 20 years ago, but they're now more possible, more implementable, because we've got slightly better training algorithms. We've got more horsepower. We're actually using the GPUs on the, on the, on the service. That was a big... Uh, uh, Realization, oh, there's a GPU in the, in the machine. If we use that, we can get 40 times speed up. So, all of a sudden, the experiment that would take uh, uh, half a day uh, can take uh, half an hour. Um, and there's more people learning about their online courses, universities teach it now. And let's talk about the hype. And uh, when I was there in the 1980s, I can't really tell what it was like in the 1940s, I wasn't born then. Uh, but in the 1980s, I was just finishing my uh, bachelor's degree in the middle of my PhD, and uh, you know, the key paper was by Hopfield, um, who presented a paper to the National Academy of on Hopfield Networks, and that was followed by a conference in Japan. Well, I remember when I was at Cambridge at the time, and I think a couple of guys at Cambridge uh, went over, and then people became really, really uh, excited. The Japanese said they're going to have a fifth generation uh, computing effort, which would basically to create a brain. That was basically the, 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 the metaphor. And all of a sudden, every continent, every country had a similar effort. In the UK it was something called the Alvi program, Europe had an pre program. All of a sudden, the US projects started getting funded in the area. And is that, even though we've seen a few more articles recently here in the last year or so, I don't think we've reached, actually reached the hype level of what we were in the late 80s. Uh, in the late 80s, in 87, 2,000 people showed up at a neural, neural network conference, right? Uh, 16, uh, uh, of the, um, uh, of 16 specific SBIR projects were neural network based. And then even people like me was getting, getting on the cover of, uh, <laughs> of, of, of magazines, right? <laughs> uh, uh, and I was just literally a graduate, just, just starting my start startup company. Um, that's 1993, right? So we haven't gotten the cover yet. We're, we're working towards it. Every day you come on the cover. <laughs> same headline. Same headline. Same, <laughs> same headline. The same. The actual article is very similar. It says robotics, credit scoring, and <laughs> speech recognition. Um, and really, I think the question for the group now is, uh, you know, is it ready for? Is data science ready for non-scientists, right? Uh, so, just like in the old days, or really old days, people used to uh, be far more educated even to use Excel, you know, to use the functions in Excel, the macros in Excel. Um, uh, you know, 
is it ready to be a, like a database tool level where you just push, but I've got data, I want to classify it, I don't care how you classify it, or I want to predict, I don't care how you predict, I just want to push a button, right? And I think there's three elements there. One is the tools itself. Two, whether, you know, is it for training or the training part, a tool versus the prediction part. And three, do you need hardware? You know, do you need hardware specifically for that? And again, the, the analogy here is, you know, are we getting to the stage where we can actually call, start the field start to move towards um, that maybe you don't need as much of a PhD to actually do the work as a, as a, as a button that you can actually use. So that, that, that completes my chat. I think we'll just have five minutes for questions, if anyone's got any questions, and then <laughs> have the next talk. Do you think this uh, current way of hype is uh, different from the one in the 80s? Uh, it's not, the peak is not as high as in the 80s yet, mm. but maybe it's getting there. I think it is, it is different than there's, uh, not because people are um, over-optimistic or under uh, or pessimistic, I think we just have more tools, right, right? we have more computing power, we have more data, we're just getting data as a major, I can remember a handwriting project, I had to actually collect data myself from hundreds of people who just run work and now there's databases out there that, that, that have it um, but I think it's a bit like the, in the 1940s where they thought they would actually create a brain you see these articles now pop up just like they had in the 80s just like they had in the 50s saying oh well this is brain computing we'll create a brain <laughs> and I think those of us who are sort of are working in it say well we're probably a, a little, still quite far from that um, but uh, and, and so, so the, the press tends to sort of latch on that. But it is appealing if you work in the area or if you're reading about it. Uh, the intuition that uh, it well, uses some of the sim similar computational processes that the brain uses it is appealing. Um, but so people uh, made more of an optimistic uh, viewpoint. So I'm not too familiar with this area, but like why? Why the build-up now, or why, you know, like... Yeah, okay, so, maybe, for, yeah, that's, uh, so not just in the last couple of years. Um, so it started off, I think, with uh, Jeff Hinton, uh, uh, who's in the uh, University of Toronto, who came up with some algorithm improvements, uh, with awesome machines, and then he started using the GPU on his computer, so it was getting 40 times speed up. So an experiment that took 40 days, now it took a day, right? So then you just get a lot further. And so Google bought him and his lab, uh, <laughs> and then, uh, and then uh, who else? Uh, uh, Yahoo bought a company. Uh, Facebook um, uh, uh, just hired a load of people from, from, from um, New York University, Yana Kuhn. Microsoft have been working on it. Uh, now they've been working on it, and it's more, more, more of a light, uh, light bulb put on it. So Baidu's got an institute, an institute of deep learning. So all of a sudden, you know, companies, amongst the cotton skate, you know, people are, are starting to look at it, right? And so therefore, uh, uh, DeepMind, you know, they were just bought for four hundred million dollars a few weeks ago. And the, and the problems or opportunities, it's, it's yeah, the problem which is which one's going to solve? Or? Yeah, the problems are these difficult problems. I mean, we still have not got to Star Trek uh, speech recognition level yet, right? I mean, it's. Uh, I've always felt I've been working on this on and off for 30 years, you know, sometimes deeply in the field, sometimes less than app stores were more of an engineering, you know, there was search engines and recommendation engines and all that, but it was more of an engineering problem. But um, uh, the problem's the same. How can we get Star Trek? So often I say, product manager bit, just, just look at Star Trek. <laughs> and Star Trek's got every, you know, and, and we're still not there for many of those Star Trek capabilities. Over there in the back. Yeah, do you see ASICs playing an important role in training on this? Yeah, good question. I, um, I mean, throughout the, the, uh, the activities I've done, we always need to be a semiconductor company and say, let's make a special chip to do speech recognition and uh, you know, to do these FFT, you know, whatever the technique was. And I always used to say, well, is it going to be, how fast is it going to be? Is it 10 times faster, 50 times faster? If it's 10 times faster, I'm not going to bother. I'll just wait 15 months. It's going to take you 50, 18 months to build it down. AC, and by that time you're at five times speed up anyway. If it's 50 times faster, let's talk. And that's what happened with neural networks and GPUs, it's 50 times faster. So A6, I think it really, I, I think 
I, I, I tend to feel, can we use some chip that's already been shipping with mainstream computers or phones? If you're using ASIC, getting an ASIC into a, a device machine is an act of God, right? So, that's an uphill task if you're a business. Do you think the GPU is good enough? I made it, yeah, well, well yeah, I think, well, the GPU has a roadmap itself, and so, is that going to, you know, it's not really today's GPU, but is the GPU roadmap good enough versus the uh, specific, I think, probably, that's my two cents. John, last question, because I know we have a uh, tight... Uh, the system. risk of being a smart ass. <laughs> <laughs> Do you come across cases like, like practical cases where it's not about the core algorithm, it's not about how much computing resource you have, but it's how you apply it, because I've noticed that some startups are like, okay, if we just had 10 times more of the power or whatever, we'd have it made. Yeah, it's good question. So mine just <laughs> reminds me of my professor at Cambridge who passed away you know, about 15 years ago. And he used to say, yeah, in, you know, journalist in industries who's asked this question, now what if we gave you, you know, a computer that was 100 times more powerful and and more, a no, hundred times more memory. By the way, we do have a hundred times more compared to <laughs> 1980. <laughs> uh, uh, and his response was, hmm, I think we'll get the same wrong answer quicker. <laughs> 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 but it's set up seriousness. I think um, there is a, it's, it's probably the speed is, you know, there's an element. Uh, I think day one, you almost do get the same wrong answer that quick. But you do more experiments that way and that improves. Um, but I think it's also about my comment, it's not just one particular text. But to build a speech recognition system, it's many, many components, you know, dictionaries, language models, user interface, uh, noise cancellation, many, many, many components that you have to put together. Now clearly, yeah, you've got a key component that solves lots of problems, that helps a lot. So I, I think there'll be questions at the 